When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> My creepy kitties, it is that most magical of days, that holiday that makes all the rest worth dealing with. That's right, it's Halloween, and this is our fantastic final finale episode. I, as ever, am your most humble of prideful hosts, Mr. Whiskers the Mad Catter, bringing you another episode of Twisted Tea Time. And for tonight's tea, I'm drinking... Well, it, it's green tea, really. Yeah, have to watch that health and all that. <sighs> Now, you may be wondering why it's taken me so long to get this episode out this time. Well, if you don't pay much attention to my social media, I, or rather my host body, and I suppose by extension me, was robbed a little while back. Uh, none were hurt, and while some expensive electronics were taken including the laptop used to make this podcast, nothing of sentimental value was spirited away. A hit to the pocketbook and our pride, as well as a colossal inconvenience, more than anything else. Though we did get the answer to that age-old question of how much is too much to drink so as to avoid having someone rob you blind? And the answer to that? Well, about half as much as we had that night, I guess. Hmm. So, the last couple of weeks have been spent scrambling to get documents in order, police reports filed, and a new job started. And less focus was spent on the show, I'll admit. But here we are, Halloween and ready for more. Now, kitties, I'm not too proud to appeal to your sense of pity, so if you feel the urge to help this show in its time of need, then please take a few minutes out of your day, go over to Stitcher Radio or iTunes or wherever else you get your podcast fix, find Twisted Tea Time and give us a friendly review. In fact, I do believe... We've received a new review fairly recently. Let's see. Hmm. Ah, yes. This is from the Lady Devere, who gives Twisted Tea Time a five star rating, calling it a creepy good time. The review reads as follows. <clears throat> I've been a fan of horror narration for about a year now, and the Mr. Whiskers only feels this obsession further. Superior narration, timing, and special effects bring tales of the macabre to eerie life. Thank you for making the workday a little creepier. You've certainly earned a chin scratch and some whiskey in my book. Well... What kind words, Lady Devere. What generosity. I do indeed enjoy chin scratches. What cat doesn't? But I think your whiskey would do far better in my belly rather than in one of your books. Books are for reading, not for whiskey. So don't worry, though. I'll, I'll gladly help you out with that. Uh, in moderation, of course. <clears throat> Now, with all that out of the way, I suppose we should get to the meat of the main event. That third and final chapter of The Call of Cthulhu. 
While technically the one year anniversary of the show will, um, uh, was about 12 days ago, I figure it's best we conclude on Halloween. And hey, there will even be a treat or two for you tonight if you keep an eye on the channel and social media. Though, I suppose that might actually be tomorrow, as I'll have to put it together a little bit and then post it, and I, I still have a live reading to do. No, details. Details! <clears throat> anyway, uh, speaking of treats, we have a special guest tonight. See if you can find out who as you listen to this final chapter. So... Without further ado, my kitties, I present to you part three of H.P. Lovecraft's magnum opus, The Call of Cthulhu. It is appropriately titled, The Madness from the Sea. The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. Part 3 The Madness from the Sea If heaven ever wishes to grant me a boon, it will be a total effacing of the results of a mere chance which fixed my eye on a certain stray piece of shelf paper. It was nothing on which I would naturally have stumbled in the course of my daily round, for it was an old number of an Australian journal the Sydney Bulletin, for April 18th, 1925. It had escaped even the cutting bureau which had, at the time of its issuance, been avidly collecting material for my uncle's research. I had largely given over my inquiries into what Professor Angel called the Cthulhu cult, and was visiting a learned friend in Patterson, New Jersey, the curator of a local museum and a mineralogist of note. Examining one day, the reserve specimens roughly set on the storage shelves in the rear room of the museum, my eye was caught by an odd picture in one of the old papers spread beneath the stones. It was the Sydney Bulletin I have mentioned, for my friend has wide affiliations in all conceivable foreign parts, and the picture was a half-tone cut of a hideous stone image, almost identical with that which Lagrasse had found in the swamp. Eagerly clearing the sheet of its precious contents, I scanned the item in detail, and was disappointed to find it of only moderate length. What it suggested, however, was of portentous significance to my flagging quest and I carefully tore it out for immediate action. It read as follows. Mystery derelict found at sea. Vigilant arrives with helpless armed New Zealand yacht in tow. One survivor and dead man found aboard. Tale of desperate battle and deaths at sea. Rescued seaman refuses particulars of strange experience. Odd idol found in his possession. Inquiry to follow. The Morrison Co's freighter, Vigilant, bound from Valparaiso, arrived this morning at its wharf in Darling Harbour. Having in tow the battled and disabled but heavily armed steam yacht, Alert, of Dunedin, New Zealand, which was sighted April 12th in S. Latitude 34, 21, West Longitude 152, 17, with one living and one dead man aboard. The Vigilant left Valparaiso March 25th and on April 2nd was driven considerably south of her course by exceptionally heavy storms and monster waves. On April 12th, the derelict was sighted, and though apparently deserted, was found upon boarding to contain one survivor in a half delirious condition and one man who had evidently been dead for more than a week. The living man was clutching a horrible stone idol of unknown origin, about one foot in height, regarding whose nature authorities at Sydney University, the Royal Society, and the museum in College Street all profess complete bafflement, and which the survivor says he found in the cabin of a yacht, in a small carved shrine of common pattern. This man, after recovering his senses, told an exceedingly strange story of piracy and slaughter. 
He is Gustav Johansson, a Norwegian of some intelligence, and had been second mate of the two master schooner Emma of Auckland, which sailed for Calio February 20th with a complement of 11 men. The Emma, he says, was delayed and thrown widely south of her course by the great storm of March 1st, and on March 22nd, in S latitude 49, 51, west longitude 128, 34, encountered the alert, manned by a queer and evil looking crew of Kanakas and half castes, being ordered peremptorily to turn back. Captain Collins refused, whereupon the strange crew began to fire savagely and without warning upon the schooner with a peculiarly heavy battery of brass cannon forming part of the yacht's equipment. The Emma's men showed fight, says the survivor, and though the schooner began to sink from shots beneath the waterline, they managed to heave alongside their enemy and board her, grappling with the savage crew on the yacht's deck and being forced to kill them all, the number being slightly superior because of their particularly abhorrent and desperate though rather clumsy mode of fighting. Three of the Emma's men, including Captain Collins and First Mate Green, were killed, and the remaining eight on the second mate Johansson proceeded to navigate the captured yacht, going ahead in their original direction to see if any reason for their ordering back had existed. The next day, it appears, they raised and landed on a small island, although none is known to exist in that part of the ocean, and six of the men somehow died ashore, though Johansson is queerly reticent about this part of his story, and speaks only of their falling into a rock chasm. Later, it seems, he and one companion boarded the yacht and tried to manage her, but were beaten about by the storm of April 2nd. From that time till his rescue on the 12th, the man remembers little, and he does not even recall when William Bryden, his companion, died. Bryden's death reveals no apparent cause and was probably due to excitement or exposure. Cable advices from Dunedin report that the alert was well known there as an island trader, and bore an evil reputation along the waterfront. It was owned by a curious group of half-castes whose frequent meetings and night trips to the woods attracted no little curiosity, and it had set sail in great haste just after the storm and earth tremors of March 1st. Our Auckland correspondent gives the Emma and her crew an excellent reputation, and Johansson is described as a sober and worthy man. The Admiralty will institute an inquiry on the whole matter beginning tomorrow, at which every effort will be made to induce Johansson to speak more freely than he has done hitherto. This was all, together with the picture of the hellish image. But what a train of ideas it started in my mind. Here were new treasuries of data on the Cthulhu cult, and evidence that it had strange interests at sea as well as on land. What motive prompted the hybrid crew to order back the Emma as they sailed about with their hideous idol? What was the unknown island on which six of the Emma's crew had died, and about which the mate Johansson was so secretive? What had the Vice Admiralty's investigation brought out, and what was known of the noxious cult in Dunedin? And most marvelous of all, what deep and more than natural linkage of dates was this which gave a malign and now undeniable significance to the various turns of events so carefully noted by my uncle. March 1st. Our February 28th, according to the international dateline. The earthquake and storm had come. From Dunedin, the alert and her noisome crew had darted eagerly forth as if imperiously summoned, and on the other side of the earth, poets and artists had begun to dream of a strange, dank cyclopean city, whilst a young sculptor had molded in his sleep the form of the dreaded Cthulhu. March 23rd. The crew of the Emma landed on an unknown island and left six men dead. And on that date, the dreams of sensitive men assumed a heightened vividness and darkened with dread of a giant monster's malign pursuit. Whilst an architect had gone mad and a sculptor had lapsed suddenly into delirium. And what of this storm of April 2nd, the date on which all dreams of the dank city ceased, 
and Wilcox emerged unharmed from the bondage of strange fever. What of all this, and of those hints of old Castro and the sunken star-born old ones in their coming reign, their faithful cult in their mastery of dreams? Was I tottering on the brink of cosmic horrors beyond man's power to bear? If so, they must be horrors of the mind alone, for in some way the 2nd of April had put a stop to whatever monstrous menace had begun its siege of mankind's soul. That evening, after a day of hurried cabling and arranging, I bade my host adieu and took a train to San Francisco. In less than a month, I was in Dunedin, where, however I found that little was known of the strange cult members who had lingered in the old sea taverns. Waterfront scum was far too common for special mention. Though there was vague talk about one inland trip these mongrels had made, during which faint drumming and red flame were noted on the distant hills. In Auckland, I learned that Johansson had returned with yellow hair turned white after a perfunctory and inconclusive questioning at Sydney, and had thereafter sold his cottage in West Street and sailed with his wife to his old home in Oslo. Of his stirring experience, he would tell his friends no more than he had told the Admiralty officials, and all they could do was to give me his Oslo address. After I went to Sydney and talked profitlessly with seamen and members of the Vice Admiralty Court, I saw the alert, now sold and in commercial use, at the Circular Quay in Sydney Cove, but gained nothing from its non-committal bulk. The crouching image with its cuttlefish head, dragon body, scaly wings, and hieroglyphed pedestal was preserved in the museum at Hyde Park, and I studied it long and well, finding it a thing of balefully exquisite workmanship. And with the same utter mystery, terrible antiquity, and unearthly strangeness of material which I had noted in Lagrasse's smaller specimen. Geologists, the curator told me, had found it a monstrous puzzle, for they vowed that the world held no rock like it. Then I thought with a shudder of what old Castro had told Lagrasse about the primal great ones. They had come from the stars and had brought their images with them. Shaken with such a mental revolution as I had never before known, I now resolved to visit Mate Johansson in Oslo. Sailing for London, I re-embarked at once for the Norwegian capital, and then one autumn day, landed at the trim wharves in the shadow of the Edgeburg. Johansson's address, I discovered, lay in the old town of King Harald Hardrada, which kept alive the name of Oslo during all the centuries that the greater city masqueraded as Christiana. I made the brief trip by taxicab and knocked with palpitant heart at the door of a neat and ancient building with plastered front. A sad-faced woman in black answered my summons, and I was stung with disappointment when she told me, in halting English, that Gustav Johansson was no more. He had not survived his return, said his wife, for the doings at sea in 1925 had broken him. He had told her no more than he had told the public, but had left a long manuscript of technical matters, as he said, written in English, evidently in order to safeguard her from the peril of casual perusal. During a walk through a narrow lane near Gothenburg Dock, a bundle of papers falling from an attic window had knocked him down, 
Two Lascar sailors at once helped him to his feet, but before the ambulance could reach him, he was dead. Physicians found no adequate cause for the end and laid it to heart trouble and a weakened constitution. I now felt a gnawing at my vitals, that dark terror which will never leave me till I too am at rest, accidentally or otherwise. Persuading the widow that my connection with her husband's technical matters was sufficient to entitle me to his manuscript, I bore the document away and began to read it on the London boat. It was a simple rambling thing, a naive sailor's effort at post facto diary, and strove to recall day by day the last awful voyage. I cannot attempt to transcribe it verbatim in all its cloudiness and redundance, but I will tell its gist enough to shew why the sound of the water against the vessel's sides became so unbearable to me that I stopped my ears with cotton. Johansson, thank God, did not know quite all. Even though he saw the city and the thing, but I shall never sleep calmly again when I think of the horrors that lurk ceaselessly behind life in time and in space, and of those unhallowed blasphemies from elder stars which dream beneath the sea, known and favored by a nightmare cult, ready and eager to loose them on the world whenever another earthquake shall heave their monstrous stone city again to the sun and air. Johansson's voyage had begun just as he told it to the Vice-Admiralty. The Emma, in ballast, had cleared Auckland on February 20th and had felt the full force of that earthquake-born tempest which must have heaved up from the sea bottom the horrors that filled men's dreams. Once more under control, the ship was making good progress when held up by the alert on March 22nd, and I could feel the mate's regret as he wrote of her bombardment and sinking. Of the swarthy cult fiends on the alert, he speaks with significant horror. There was some peculiarly abominable quality about them which made their destruction seem almost a duty and Johansson shews ingenious wonder at the charge of ruthlessness brought against his party during the proceedings of the Court of Inquiry. Then, driven ahead by curiosity in their captured yacht under Johansson's command, the men sight a great stone pillar sticking out of the sea, and in south latitude 47 degrees 9 minutes, and west longitude 126 degrees and 43 minutes, come upon a coastline of mingled mud, ooze, and weedy cyclopean masonry, which can be nothing less than the tangible substance of Earth's supreme terror. The nightmare corpse city of Rillier, that was built in measureless aeons behind history by the vast, loathsome shapes that seeped down from the dark stars. There lay great Cthulhu and his hordes, hidden in green, slimy vaults and sending out at last, after cycles incalculable, the thoughts that spread fear to the dreams of the sensitive and called imperiously to the faithful to come on a pilgrimage of liberation and restoration. All this Johansson did not suspect, but God knows he soon saw enough. I suppose that only a single mountaintop, the hideous monolith-crowned citadel whereon Great Cthulhu was buried, actually emerged from the waters. When I think of the extent of all that may be brooding down there, I almost wish to kill myself forthwith. 
Johansson and his men were awed by the cosmic majesty of this dripping Babylon of elder daemons, and must have guessed without guidance that it was nothing of this or of any sane planet. Awe at the unbelievable size of the greenish stone blocks, at the dizzying height of the great carven monolith, and at the stupefying identity of the colossal statues and bas-reliefs with the queer image found in the shrine on the alert is poignantly visible in every line of the mate's frightened description. Without knowing what futurism is like, Johansson achieved something very close to it when he spoke of the city. For instead of describing any definite structure or building, he dwells only on broad impressions of vast angles and stone surfaces. Surfaces too great to belong to anything right or proper for this earth, and impious with horrible images and hieroglyphs. I mention his talk about angles because it suggests something Wilcox had told me of his awful dreams. He had said that the geometry of the dream place he saw was abnormal, non-Euclidean, and loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart from ours. Now, an unlettered seaman felt the same thing whilst gazing at the terrible reality. Johansson and his men landed at a sloping mud bank on this monstrous acropolis and clambered slipperily up over tight and oozy blocks which could have been no mortal staircase. The very sun of heaven seemed distorted when viewed through the polarizing miasma welling out from this sea-soaked perversion, and twisted menace and suspense lurked leeringly in those crazy elusive angles of carved rock where a second glance shewed concavity after the first shewed convexity. Something very like fright had come over all the explorers before anything more definite than rock and ooze and weed was seen. Each would have fled had he not feared the scorn of the others, and it was only half-heartedly that they searched vainly as it proved, for some portable souvenir to bear away. It was Rodriguez, the Portuguese, who climbed up the foot of the monolith and shouted of what he had found. The rest followed him, and looked curiously at the immense carved door with the now familiar squid dragon bas relief. It was, Johansson said, like a great barn door, and they all felt that it was a door because of the ornate lintel, threshold, and jams around it, though they could not decide whether it lay flat like a trap door, or slantwise like an outside cellar door. As Wilcox would have said, the geometry of the place was all wrong. One could not be sure that the sea and the ground were horizontal, hence the relative position of everything else seemed phantasmally variable. Bryden pushed at the stone in several places without result. Then Donovan felt over it delicately around the edge, pressing each point separately as he went. He climbed interminably along the grotesque stone molding, that is, one would call it climbing if the thing was not, after all, horizontal. And the men wondered how any door in the universe could be so vast. Then, very softly and slowly, the acre-great panel began to give inward at the top, and they saw it was balanced. Donovan slid or somehow propelled himself down or along the jam and rejoined his fellows, and everyone watched the queer recession of the monstrously carven portal. In this fantasy of prismatic distortion, it moved anomalously in a diagonal way, 
so that all the rules of matter and perspective seemed upset. The aperture was black, with a darkness almost material. That tenebrousness was indeed a positive quality, for it obscured such parts of the inner walls as ought to have been revealed, and actually burst forth like smoke from its aeon-long imprisonment, visibly darkening the sun as it slunk away into the shrunken and gibbous sky on flapping membranous wings. The odor rising from the newly opened depths was intolerable, and at length the quick-eared Hawkins thought he heard a nasty, slopping sound down there. Everyone listened, and everyone was listening still when it lumbered slobberingly into sight and gropingly squeezed its gelatinous green immensity through the black doorway into the tainted outside air of that poisoned city of madness. Poor Johansson's handwriting almost gave out when he wrote of this. Of the six men who never reached the ship, he thinks two perished of pure fright in that accursed instant. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. God. What wonder that, across the earth, a great architect went mad and poor Wilcox raved with fever in that telepathic instant. The thing of the idols. The green, sticky spawn of the stars had awakened to claim his own. The stars were right again, and what an age-old cult had failed to do by design a band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After vigintillions of years, great Cthulhu was loose again and ravening for delight. Three men were swept up by the flabby claws before anybody turned. God rest them if there be any rest in the universe. They were Donovan, Guerra, and Angstrom. Parker slipped as the other three were plunging frenziedly over endless vistas of green-crusted rock to the boat, and Johansson swears he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry, which shouldn't have been there. An angle which was acute, but behaved as if it were obtuse. So only Biden and Johansson reached the boat and pulled desperately for the alert as the mountainous monstrosity flopped down the slimy stones and hesitated, floundering at the edge of the water. Steam had not been suffered to go down entirely, despite the departure of all hands for the shore, and it was the work of only a few moments of feverish rushing up and down between wheel and engines to get the alert underway. Slowly, Amidst the distorted horrors of that indescribable scene, she began to churn the lethal waters, whilst on the masonry of that charnel shore that was not of earth, the titan thing from the stars slavered and gibbered like Polypheme cursing the fleeing ship of Odysseus. Then, bolder than the storied Cyclops, Great Cthulhu slid greasily into the water and began to pursue with vast wave-raising strokes of cosmic potency. Bryden looked back and went mad, laughing shrilly as he kept on laughing at intervals till death found him one night in the cabin whilst Johansson was wandering deliriously. But Johansson had not given out yet. Knowing that the thing could surely overtake the alert until steam was fully up, he resolved on a desperate chance, and setting the engine for full speed, ran lightning-like on deck and reversed the wheel. 
There was a mighty eddying and foaming in the noisome brine. And as the steam mounted higher and higher, the brave Norwegian drove his vessel head on against the pursuing jelly which rose above the unclean froth like the stern of a daemon galleon. The awful squid head with writhing feelers came nearly up to the bowsprit of the sturdy yacht, but Johansen drove on relentlessly. There was a bursting as of an exploding bladder, a squishy nastiness as of a cloven sunfish, a stench as of a thousand open graves, and a sound that the chronicler would not put on paper. For an instant, the ship was befouled by an acrid and blinding green cloud, and then there was only a venomous seething astern, where, God in heaven, the scattered plasticity of that nameless sky spawn was nebulously recombining in its hateful original form. Whilst its distance widened every second, as the alert gained impetus from its mounting steam. And that was all. After that, Johansen only brooded over the idol in the cabin and attended to a few matters of food for himself and the laughing maniac by his side. He did not try to navigate after the first bold flight, for the reaction had taken something out of his soul. Then came the storm of April 2nd, and a gathering of the clouds about his consciousness. There is a sense of spectral whirling through liquid gulfs of infinity, of dizzying rides through reeling universes on a comet's tail, and of hysterical plunges from the pit to the moon, and from the moon back again to the pit all livened by a cacinating chorus of the distorted, hilarious elder gods and the green, bat-winged, mocking imps of Tartarus. Out of that dream came rescue. The vigilant, the vice-admiralty court, the streets of Dunedin, and the long voyage back home to the old house by Edgeburg. He could not tell. They would think him mad. He would write of what he knew before death came, but his wife must not guess. Death would be a boom if only it could blot out the memories. That was the document I read, and now I have placed it in the tin box beside the bas relief and the papers of Professor Angel. With it, shall go this record of mine, this test of my own sanity, wherein is pieced together that which I hope may never be pieced together again. I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror, and even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poisoned to me. I do not think my life will be long. As my uncle went, as poor Johansen went, so I shall go. I know too much, and the cult still lives. Cthulhu still lives too, I suppose. Again in that chasm of stone which has shielded him since the sun was young. His accursed city is sunken once more, for the vigilant sailed over the spot after the April storm. But his ministers on earth still bellow and prance and slay around idle-capped monoliths in lonely places. He must have been trapped by the sinking whilst within his black abyss, or else the world would by now be screaming with fright and frenzy. Who knows the end? What has risen 
may sink, and what has sunk may rise. Loathsomeness waits, and dreams in the deep, and decay spreads over the tottering cities of men. A time will come, but I must not and cannot think. Let me pray that, if I do not survive this manuscript, my executors may put caution before audacity and see to it that it meets no other eye. Well, my creepy kitties, I believe that is what we call a cutting it close. And to think, this brief moment of awakening for a great Cthulhu and the subsequent storm that likely signaled the sinking of Rillier were psychic phenomena that were strong enough to drive men mad the world over. He is hoping old Squidface stays sleeping a little while longer. I rather like playing with humans. I'd rather it not end too soon. Meow. For those of you not in the know, the voice of the Sydney Bulletin was none other than stories, fables, ghostly tales. So. If you want to hear more of our good friend on our show, go ahead and check out episode 132 called The Guest. He also has his own podcast, naturally, where he tells, well, uh, stories and um, fables and I suppose some tales of the... Uh, uh, ghostly sort? Well, um, anyway, you can search for him on Facebook, SoundCloud.com, YouTube, iTunes, and even more places out there in the aether of the internet. So go ahead and give him a listen and tell him that the Mad Catter sent you. Remember, that's stories, fables, ghostly tales. <sighs> So, my kitties, it has been a year. Thirty-eight episodes have come and gone. Well, uh, thirty-seven, really. I'm not sure where I got the thirty-eighth from. I mean, uh, obviously episode two doesn't exist. I mean, it never happened, and you can't prove anything. And if you can, it's obviously the Mandela Effect. Mandela Effect? Mandela Effect. There we are. <clears throat> anyway, let's see if we can keep up the good work, keep spinning those yarns, telling those tales, and then some. Among ideas for the future, my kitties, I'll be working on streaming video games of appropriate themes and doing live readings of horror stories and some of the darker fairy tales from Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen. Oh, there are so many of those to pick from. And probably others as well, I just have to find them. If you do want to watch more of me and my mischief streaming live or post live after death, whatever, go to twitch.tv forward slash one mad catter. That's one like the number, M-A-D-C-A-T-T-E-R. In fact, tonight, in just a few minutes, if I do this right, I'll be telling horror stories to commemorate the holiday of Halloween. So tune in. There are great things in store. Alas, my friends, the time has come. By all the gods, season one is done! My, oh my, how time does fly. 
But this is just the beginning. And definitely not goodbye. <laughs> Pleasant dreams, my kitties. Sleep sweet. <laughs> The Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or they are simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for this episode of Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com, as well as co, that's C-O, dot ag, that's A-G, at uh, soundcloud.com forward slash C-O dash A-G. This episode's podcast shout-out was Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales, and they can be found at soundcloud.com forward slash stories dash fables dash ghostly dash tales. You can also find them on Facebook, YouTube, and other places as well. If you want to support the show and help us grow, then leave a review or rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever else you get your podcast fix. Or you can also go to patreon.com forward slash themadcatter and sign up for a low-cost monthly subscription to get bonus goodies. For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com forward slash Cheshire Hats or Twitter at RealMadCatter. And you can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Cheshire Hats. Good night, kitties. Pleasant Pleasant dreams. dreams.